talk about the fusion, the fusion right here is the movement of solutes from higher concentrations to areas of lower solute concentration. Now, usually we use example like this, right? The example that is, you have this solute, right? You have these two beakers. Beaker A right here is just pure water. Beaker B is water and lots of salt, sodium chloride, lots of it. Right? Now, separate it, nothing happens. What happens if you start to connect them? Well, what happens is the salt on this side starts to move around and it bounces off and goes to the area of lower solute. Here, areas where there's no sodium at all. So we're going from a high solute concentration to areas of low solute concentration. That's the law of diffusion high to low solute concentration movement. Now, what happens then? What happens then is so much sodium comes here that eventually you hit an equilibrium. Equilibrium means that the sodium on this side equals the sodium on this side. When that happens, they might still have movement of sodium from beaker A to beaker B, or it can even occur in vice versa but there's no more net movement of sodium chloride anymore once you hit equilibrium. The larger the concentration difference, the faster the rate of movement. So we want concentration differences. This is why having this concentration difference for sodium and potassium is so important, right? As sodium is pumped out, well, it becomes very, very concentrated. That sodium wants to come back in following the law of diffusion. All we need is an ion channel to open up. As an ion channel for sodium opens up, like we saw in the ligand gated channels, what happens? It just follows the law of diffusion. Sodium goes from high, outside the cell, to low, inside the cell. So in terms of diffusion, it is nothing more than the movement of salts, solutes, proteins, any solid from higher concentrations to lower concentrations. Perfect, that's exactly right? Now, not only is it what we want, this is usually what causes even oxygen to go from our cells, from, go from the bloodstream into our cells. Here's why. In our bloodstream, we're always gonna have a lot of oxygen attached to red blood cells. In the cell, you're gonna use oxygen, you're gonna use glucose, Combined, you're going to form a lot of ATPs through aerobic respiration. We'll talk more about aerobic respiration next semester. All right? But if you keep using a lot of oxygen and glucose to make a lot of energy, what happens? Inside the cell, you're going to have less oxygen because you use it all. Inside the cell, you'll also have less glucose because you're using it all to make ATP. Now, your bloodstream carries oxygen. High oxygen in your bloodstream, low in your cells. Oxygen can just go right through your cell, from high oxygen content to low, which is perfect, right? Which is exactly what we want, right? We want oxygen to get into our cells. We want it to become unhindered as well, to make it easy for it to move. Now, one of the consequences of aerobic respiration is the production of lots of carbon dioxide, lots of it. This is why we exhale carbon dioxide. Well, the carbon dioxide is so high inside the cell, so low in your bloodstream, that now we have a concentration gradient for this gas. So carbon dioxide from your 
cell wants to leak out and enter your blood vessel, allowing us to get rid of this possibly toxic carbon dioxide gas. So we see diffusion occurring all the time in our cells. Now, we don't really see a lot of simple diffusion. This is simple diffusion. Oxygen goes in, doesn't need help. It goes right through the plasma membrane. Carbon dioxide goes out, goes right through the plasma membrane. Remember, gas is passed through without help. Now, glucose, remember, we're gonna use glucose a lot. Using glucose right here will allow us to then have lower glucose count to make energy. The problem with it is, as we have low glucose, right, we still need to bring that, all right, so inside the cell, we have low glucose count. We have just eaten, so in our blood vessel, lots of glucose in our bloodstream. Now we have a concentration gradient, again, for glucose. But glucose cannot go through without help. This is why insulin is so important. Insulin allows glucose receptors to, to be put in your plasma membrane. The glucose receptors then have binding sites for glucose. But the reason why glucose goes from the outside into your cell is because of the concentration gradient. All the glucose receptor does is provide a receptor for you to have glucose entering the cell. That's it, right? It's not pushing glucose through. The only thing causing glucose to go through is a concentration gradient, right? High glucose concentration in your bloodstream because you've just eaten, and now low in your cells. Now we have a concentration gradient, and now we should have what's called facilitated diffusion. So we don't see a lot of simple diffusion, where you just have cells, go, you know, materials going in and out without help, we do see a lot of facilitated diffusion, where you have a receptor for the material. And the receptor allows some substance to follow its concentration gradient. Here, glucose, right? High glucose in the bloodstream, low in your cells. What happens? Glucose wants to go into your cells, but it can't get through without a receptor. Insulin allows those receptors to be placed. The more receptors, the more glucose enters your cells. Perfect. That's facilitated diffusion. Now, we do see a lot of examples of that facilitated diffusion. The next thing we'll talk about is osmosis. Osmosis is slightly different. Osmosis is movement of water. Movement of water, right? It's a movement of water from higher solute concentrations. All right, so here, I'm just right, right here. Here's osmosis. Movement of water from areas of lower solute to areas of higher solute concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. So you need some kind of membrane. That membrane is important because if we didn't have the membrane, we just have the fusion, right? So what we have is this, same example right here. You have one region right here where it's just one beaker that's just pure water. That's it. One beaker right here that's water and lots of sodium chloride. Right? When we connect it, now I'm going to put a little membrane in between. The membrane stops 
sodium from going in from one test tube to the next or one beaker to the next, right? It prevents us from having just simple diffusion. That membrane is important. So what happens? Well, water here, right, wants to go from low solute, where there's no solute here, it's just pure water. Well, that water wants to go into the opposite direction right here. It wants to go from area where there's low solute, beaker A, to area where there's high solute concentration, beaker B. The water moves through. As the water moves through, you increase the volume in beaker B because you keep adding water to it, right? So what happens is eventually you'll hit an equilibrium, but if there's no sodium chloride here, almost all of the water will go to this beaker B then. Now, we do see osmosis having a huge effect in our body. It does play a big role in certain kind of circumstances. Now, obviously, we don't have like a, a semi-permeable semi-permeable membrane as we imagine it, but we do kind of have a semi-permeable membrane, all our cells has, and that's our plasma membrane. Now, we will talk in a second about what happens when we put, in some high school, you know, chemistry classes, they use this example as well, right? What they'll do is just, you have pure water here, right, in your beaker, and then you put red blood cells in here. A red blood cell, right? You have a lot of proteins and salts. You have lots of fats in a red blood cell. You have a lot of solutes in a red blood cell. You also have a lot of water in the red blood cell. Lots of solutes. What happens? Well, the solutes inside can't get through the plasma membrane. But what can? Remember, water, gases, fats. They go right through without any help, right? Well, water can go through in either direction. Here, you have pure water, so now you have low to zero solute in the beaker. That water wants to go from low to high. So all the water from the beaker then goes inside my red blood cells, causing my red blood cell to swell up. And then because it's pure water on the outside, so much water goes into your red blood cells that it swells up and bursts, causing the cell to die. Now, you're probably wondering, when does this happen, right? It does happen from time to time. There was a contest in uh, California when the Nintendo Wii was at a height of, of its popularity. I don't know if you guys remember, but it was crazy how popular the Nintendo Wii was. We're talking about people waiting in lines for hours, for the chance to, to you know, go and buy a Wii. Well, what happened was in California, this radio station ran up a little, you know, little type of uh, game where whoever holds your Wii for the longest time without peeing wins a Nintendo Wii. So you have hundreds of moms and dads trying to win that contest. What happened? They drink lots and lots of water and they try to hold their urine as much and for as long as possible, right? The person that won held the urine for hours. I'm talking about like a day and a half, right? Way too long. And they drink pure water. Because they drink pure water, the water got absorbed into the bloodstream. Now you have more water surrounding the cells, right, than there should be, right? So the water started to leak out of the cells as it goes from all right, you add water to anything, you make it more dilute. So you add water to the blood, the blood's osmolarity started to drop. As it started to drop, the water in the bloodstream started to move into the cells, into the space between the cells. And then the person started to swell up, right? As she started to swell up, the legs and the arms even got swollen. Eventually, there's one place where swelling can cause you to die your brain. She swelled so much, she had cerebral edema, and she herniated her brain stem. The person that won died as a result of this, all because of drinking so much pure water and not letting herself pee. So you hear people, you know, drinking a lot of water, as long as you let yourself pee, you can drink gallons of pure water. It doesn't matter. You need to let yourself pee. If you don't, 
and you hold it in, then that's where we get the water toxicity. Once she started to have seizures, then they brought her into the hospital, but then it was too late, right? The brain started to herniate through the foramen magnum, and in order to try to save her life, they actually had emergency surgery where they removed part of the skull, right? As they cut through and removed part of the skull, they're hoping that the edema would kind of move upwards, not downwards. You can't really suction the brain, right? It's very fragile. So you can't make it go upwards. So they just had to wait, and with waiting and time, right, the swelling was so much so that they actually had to put her in a medically induced coma, give her a paralytic, so then she didn't have seizures. And she died, all right, a couple days after. All because of drinking pure water. Crazy, right? So again, drinking water is great. And hopefully you guys know, if you have the urge to pee, maybe hold it for a little bit, but let yourself pee. Right. Obviously, if you're in the classroom, you hold it for a little longer, okay? Right. But you need to let yourself urinate. And so osmosis right here, and here's an example that we give right here with the red blood cells. You have pure water, and you put the red blood cells in pure water. What do we have? Right? When you have the red blood cells in pure water, we're going to see that you're going to have a little bit of a bursting of the red blood cell. That does happen. Hopefully, you know, usually not a lot though, which is good. Now, when you go to the ER and you're dehydrated, do they just give you a bottle of water and no. tell you to go home? No, right? They give you saline. The saline that they put in your body, the sodium chloride, that they put the bag of saline on right there, right? Is isotonic to our to the plasma in our blood meaning it's got the same solute concentration, and it's been titered that way, all right? So it's got the same solute concentration as your plasma. So all the solutes combined, right, makes up about 300 milliosmoles per liter. That's what we see in our saline bag. So when you do give somebody saline, you're giving them isotonic solution. So then it's easily incorporated, and you don't have that water toxicity. Now, just as bad as drinking pure water and not drinking is drinking seawater, right? If you drink seawater, seawater has even more solutes than the solutes found in your cells. So what happens? When we drink seawater, right, there's more solute than what's found in our red blood cell. What occurs? The water in your red blood cells wants to leak out. And that's what we see here. The water in the red blood cells, drawn by higher solute, found in seawater. What happens? The red blood cell starts to shrink, shrivel, and die off. We call it cremation. Not cremation, right? Cremation, right? And that's a cell shrinking, and then it kind of dies because you can't maintain the, the border, and the cell just shrinks away and dies. Right? So usually we're not gonna be in that situation where we're drinking such high osmolarity type of fluid, even Gatorade isn't that high, right, compared to seawater, which is. That's why they tell you never to drink seawater. If you drink a little bit, that's okay, all right? Don't freak out, right? Sometimes, you know, you're swimming and a little gets in your mouth and you accidentally swallow it, all right? We're, we're talking about gallons of it. Don't drink that. Hopefully we understand that, right? All right, um, last thing we'll talk about, and this is kind of goes back to the saturation of the solutes that we talked about with glucose receptors, being overwhelmed in people with diabetes. By the way, do you guys used to know, do you guys know what the doctors used to do to check if you have diabetes? Because you know, I mean, you didn't have test strips in the 1800s, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we know we used to have diabetes? A doctor will stick their finger in the urine and taste it. Right? So you hope to God you got some very, very sensitive taste buds for sweetness, right? Or else you'd be drinking it. Right? But either way, is that's how they would tell back then, is they would stick the finger in and, and taste it. Mm -hmm. right? Now the bad thing is, up until pretty recently, you, there's really nothing you could have done. You couldn't give people with type 1 diabetes insulin in the 1700s and 1800s. Right? But you do know that you know, the people with type 1 diabetes back then didn't live long. 
Nowadays, not, uh, insulin's like increased in price tremendously, but still, you know, it's still kind of present. We can still get it. And I use insulin a lot because you do see a huge amount of people right now, even type two diabetics that are on insulin, something we never used to see. Right. Sodium potassium pump is an example of an active transport pump, is an example of, right, an example of an ATP pump. Now keep in mind, when we go with the fusion, right, if we go from high solute concentration to low solute concentration, do you have to put energy into it? No, right, you're going and you're following the law of diffusion. But if you're going against the law of diffusion and you're going against a concentration gradient, that's what we're doing with the sodium potassium pump. And the sodium potassium pump, the more I work this pump, the more sodium I pump out. The more sodium I pump out, the lower the sodium on the inside, the higher it is on the outside. I still wanna keep pumping it out. So when I'm going against the concentration gradient, I have to put a lot of ATP in there. I have to put a lot of energy in there, right? I always use an example, right? Ever, ever, I don't know, bike downhill? When you start biking or running downhill, it's easy, right? That's going with the flow. It's going with the concentration gradient. You don't need to really, you know, put energy in when you're running downhill or riding a bike downhill. It's actually, you probably put more energy to slow down, right? How about biking uphill? When you're biking uphill, you go to like the lowest gear possible, and still, depending on the hill, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot out of you to get up that hill. That's what's happening when you're going against a concentration gradient. When you're going against a concentration gradient, you're going against that natural flow. In order to do that, you need to put in a lot of energy. That energy is in the form of ATP. Now, with a sodium potassium pump, you not only go against the concentration gradient for sodium, remember, sodium wants to come in, you still need to pump it out, but you do it as well for potassium. For every three sodiums you pump out, you bring two potassiums in. If you bring two potassiums in, eventually, you're gonna have a lot of potassium on the inside, very little on the outside, yet I still wanna pump it in, right? So in the sodium potassium pump, you're going against the concentration difference in both sodium and potassium. The crazy thing is nearly 40 to 50% of your daily caloric value, right? So the calories that we eat, right? So some books say 40, some books says 50, right? Almost 40 to 50% is just to run the single sodium potassium pump in every cell of your body. Right? So that's a lot of calories just to run that pump. Now obviously we have a lot of these pumps in every cell, but yeah, we're willing to use that energy because this pump is so important. Here's another example of look for here, right? With active transport, we can pump against the concentration gradient. Here they're showing you the concentration gradient for sodium in the green, very high on the outside, very low on the inside. Yet I still want to pump it up, out. In order for that to happen, I have to put energy in. Required 40% of your cellular ATP, which is crazy. And this one kind of shows you again, right? The difference in the sodium and the potassium and that you're going against the concentration gradient for both. Right. Uh, anybody who's ever heard of cystic fibrosis? It's a terrible disease. The thing about cystic fibrosis is that it can cause you to have lung failure and you have, usually people are very thin because the pancreas does not make the proper enzymes. Right. So with cystic fibrosis, the weird thing is, the only issue is you have an abnormal chloride ion transporter. That's it. Right. You, right, you have a mutated chloride ion transport. The problem is, without that chloride ion being pumped out of the cells, water doesn't follow. 
When water doesn't follow, right, the mucus in your lungs, the mucus in your right, respiratory system gets to be very, very thick. Normally, we have a little bit of sodium, a little bit of chlorine, and a little bit of water, a little bit of saline to kind of thin out the mucus. So then when we cough, <clears throat> when we clear our throat, the mucus isn't so thick that we can't expel it from our lungs.